From judges refusing to touch the food, let alone eat it, to dishes that went flying straight into the trash. Courtesy of our man Joe. Here's a look at some of those times when contestants were completely embarrassed on MasterChef. There have been times when Ramsey, against all odds, decided to change the rules of the game. But nobody saw this coming. Tonight, two of you will be going home. You couldn't drop a bigger bombshell. I was not expecting that at all. The judges, they're setting the standard up. A double elimination. Yeah, that turned that entire season of MasterChef upside down. Now, I've known Ramsey to make some really wise decisions in the past. And the most important of them all is the one where he decides who's to stay and who's to leave. And this particular challenge from season 10 left everyone stunned. You see, it doesn't take long for the master chef to totally shake things up. So what happened is Michael Silverstein rocked the kitchen all throughout the episode. But things got crazy when Ramsey and the gang decided to do this. Sarah and Noah will clash and go down right away. Alphas, baby. So our final team, Michael, yep. Liz. Scary, right? Bet nobody saw that coming. I mean, kicking out not just one, but two contestants during the tag team challenge was not the kind of twist I was prepared for. So here's the deal. The judges usually pair up a strong cook with a weaker one, hoping the weak link would drag down the stronger one, or the stronger one would lift up the weaker one. A pair up strategy as old as time. But if you ask me, they did Michael real dirty with this one. I mean, he was the top contender right from the start in season 10. There was one home cook that stood out. Michael, make your way up to the balcony. Congrats. Thank you, guys. But in a bid to twist things up a bit, the judges threw in the tag team challenge way too early in the competition and decided to send two cooks packing the boot. It wasn't even necessary. But then the judges pulled another surprise move by making the challenge even more difficult. You get to pair the eight home cooks into teams of two. Tonight, each team will have to replicate this exact platter. But here's the real kicker. The teams had to whip up an international platter, featuring dishes from different countries, like pork spring rolls from the Philippines, vegetable samosas with mint chutney from India, meatballs from Italy, fish tacos with pica de gallo from Mexico, beef skewers from Morocco, and pork dumplings from China. Well, big whoop, right? But guess what? The judges decided to take the challenge to the next level. But that's not quite enough. It's more. It's season 10. So you also have to add one more dish of your very own to that platter. Yep, they had to handle all six dishes at once. And on top of that, they were racing against the clock, switching between cooks, and to make matters worse, each team had to add their own seventh dish. What's more, they had just 75 minutes to pull everything off. Yeah, this challenge was absolutely insane. Cut that meat in a cube for me, please. Yes. Cut that meat in a cube. But as a bit of a reprieve, before the clock started ticking, they had a moment to choose their seventh dish and gather their ingredients. Glad they gave them that much, at least. Anyway, Michael suggested shrimp tempura with a ponzu sauce, and Liz, even though she hadn't made a single dish featured in the platter before, went along with it. When Sam and Shari presented their dishes, it was a disaster. What is that? Raw. The fish for their taco was raw, the samosas were oddly shaped and filled with raw dough, and the potatoes were way too mushy. What's more, the pot stickers hadn't been properly sealed and were drowning in sesame oil. But coming back to Michael and Liz, let's see who fares better. All right, so I'm going to start with this spring roll because this looks a little bit more promising. Who took the lead on that one? I made the filling and I rolled it and I fried it. Well, I'm sorry to tell ya, but the spring roll and beef skewer weren't any better. Here's the deal. It's over, oversaturated with the aromatics. It's really okay. strong. They were overly seasoned, and the meatballs turned out hard and dry. 
And to top it off, the shrimp tempura, which was supposed to have a homemade ponzu sauce, ended up with a mix of sriracha and soy sauce. The judges were not impressed at all. Joe, bless his heart, even said this. You can't come up here and fake it and put sriracha or just soy sauce in the thing and tell us it's a sauce. Please respect our intelligence and don't bring us crap. It's safe to say that we're looking at a zero out of seven situation here. In the end, Sam and Shari somehow managed to scrape by with just enough to avoid elimination, while every dish presented by Michael and Liz had a bunch of problems of their own. Sadly, their lackluster performance sealed their fate, which is why Michael and Liz were sent packing on the same day. Michael and Liz, you've cooked for the last time in the Masterchef kitchen. Come up here and say goodbye, please. If you ask me, it was so shocking to see Michael, who had shown promise, end up in 15th place due to his inability to work well with Liz. And you know what? He looked pretty frustrated throughout the whole challenge. This has not nearly enough There's already salt in there. I just think they need a little tiny dust of cumin on the outside. Not too much, it's strong. But hey. That's MasterChef for ya, unpredictable as it gets. But even the viewers couldn't help but feel sad for Michael. He was a good chef, and he was done real dirty. Though, fortunately for him, that wasn't the end of his MasterChef journey. He got another shot and back to win, where he had the chance to compete once again, and what a comeback he made. Well, he didn't take the top prize, top three ain't bad. You see, Michael had the skills to go far in the competition, and this time, he came back to prove it. Glad they saw how they did him earlier and brought him back for another shot. And there was yet another silver lining. The experience opened doors to a bunch of new opportunities for him in the culinary world. Though, coming back to the concept of double elimination team challenges, this little twist in the show's format hasn't been real popular. A ton of fans have called for the showrunners to ditch the double elimination team challenges entirely. They pointed out how most of the time, someone ends up getting the short end of the stick, and Michael's exit was a prime example of that. Anyway, sticking with the topic of unexpected eliminations a bit longer, here's Ramsey's take on that. Man, that's delicious. It reaffirms that you left this competition last time around way too prematurely because that is finale worthy. And in this next episode, Ramsey was at a crossroads once again. He had to make a decision and give someone the boot, but what he decided to do instead was unbelievable. It was also delicious. Congratulations, upstairs. Yeah, turns out there was going to be no elimination. So what happened is the blue team had lost the team challenge, and this put them in a tight spot. They had to face the pressure test, which was described as the hardest in MasterChef history. Any guesses what they'd need to face? Well, they had to make a cheese souffle in just 90 minutes. What's more, the home cooks had to make as many as they could, but could only present the best to the judges. If the pressure from the challenge wasn't already intense enough, the tension brewing between Christian and Jennifer didn't do them any favors. It's They're gonna have a kid that's not gonna like an onion. They're never even gonna know it's in there if it's shaved. But it's Done gonna it flavor it. Okay, I, I had my five-year-old nephew, and let me tell you something, the kid doesn't eat and he would eat that. Talk about a clash of egos. Anyway, Christian was the first to present his souffle, and it looked and smelled great, but was it gonna impress? Huh. That's strange. Well, up next, Adrian and Jennifer followed up, but again, no comments from the judges. This was followed by Derek, who took the risk of making two batches, serving his souffle right at the end of the 90th minute. And once again, the judges kept their opinions to themselves. But don't let their silence fool you. They were making some big decisions, first of which was declaring Jennifer and Derek safe. And surprisingly, Adrian's souffles turned out delicious too, so he was safe, leaving Christian standing all by himself. Christian. So where does that leave him now? Is he done for? Well, this is when Ramsey altered a rule for that evening alone. It was also delicious. Congratulations. It was a twist that left everyone wondering what would happen next. 
Would two competitors be sent home in the following episode? Well, the suspense was definitely building, I'll tell you that much. But this wasn't the only time all of the contestants were spared. Take for example Season 9, where everyone made flawless heart-themed dishes, no mistakes to speak of. Bowen certainly had a twist of fate in his favor by winning the Mystery Box Challenge. However, his advantage came with a unique twist. While he had the power to choose the protein for the Elimination Challenge, all the options were the hearts of different meats. Duck, tuna, lamb, beef. And they also threw an artichoke. You know, for good measure. Bowen initially considered giving himself the vegetable option, thinking it might be the easiest to cook. Little did he know about the secret catch. The judges believed that artichoke was best suited for Mediterranean dishes and couldn't be used in an Asian fusion creation, which they assumed Bowen had planned for. But when they walked up to his table, they were in for a shock. What's inside the rolls? The mushroom. No artichoke. No artichoke. The guy didn't want to put those artichokes in the main component of his dish because he had never cooked with them before. Ramsey was so confused that he had to remind him what the challenge was all about. It's supposed to be a heart dish. You've got the easiest heart, artichoke hearts. Yes, chef. Despite this, those sneaky little hearts ended up making the plate since he crafted a delicious artichoke salad with quail egg, cabbage roll, and shrimp. As for the other contestants, Caesar tackled the challenging tuna heart with impressive tuna heart kebabs, which featured sesame rice and roasted mushrooms, and he nailed the flavors. Next, Samantha worked with duck heart and created a grilled duck heart dish with brown rice, cranberry compote, and cabbage slaw. Although it didn't look amazing on the plate, the flavors were on point. Mm, that's delicious. Thank you. Ashley presented a Moroccan-inspired fried lamb heart with couscous, roasted vegetables, and tomato ragu, which turned out like this. Incredible. Incredible. Then, Jaron presented his beef heart twist on beef and onions featuring herb potato mash, sautéed cabbage, and stewed tomatoes. Well, the plating wasn't anything to write home about. Did his flavors manage to impress? The actual cook is perfect. So it tastes way better than it looks. Thank you, chef. Oh yeah, it was definitely up there. In the end, both Jaron and Samantha ended up in the bottom too. But every dish had some real impressive flavors, so much so that they decided to do this instead. Tonight, there was nothing separating the flavor profile of each and every one of your hearts. Yep, it looks like the heart dishes had won the judges' hearts, and none of the contestants were eliminated that night. And let's not forget this twist from season eight, where Ramsey made yet another bold yet positive move. Flawless, Jeff. Thank Ebony, you. Ebony, perfection. Kate, incredible. There is nothing to send you home on. Making chocolate souffle is never easy. However, Ebony, Kate, and Jeff were determined to prove themselves. But Jeff had some concerns. We know that desserts are an Achilles heel. I don't like souffles. You don't like souffles? I don't like souffles. I don't like souffles. Wow. Surprisingly, all three contestants presented beautifully risen and impressive looking souffles, defying expectations. But were the judges impressed? Well, when they tasted all three, there was a lot of tension in the air. Ramsey didn't say a word after tasting Jeff's dessert. Aaron didn't provide much feedback after Ebony's, and Christina had a funny expression after trying Kate's. Like, come on, what were we supposed to make of that? But that's when the judges finally spilled the beans. We have never, ever come to a decision where we cannot separate three incredible souffles. Each one of your souffles was good enough to hit any of our restaurant's table this evening. Yeah. They couldn't make up their minds. In a surprising turn of events, Ramsey announced that everyone had done so well that he couldn't bear to send anyone home. What's more, for the first time ever, all three souffles were good enough to be served at their restaurants. Talk about an unexpected outcome. But this next rule change really got on a lot of viewers' nerves. This time around, the home cooks got to choose any 20 ingredients they wanted from the MasterChef pantry. And boy, were they excited. But there was a catch. Tonight, you will each be cooking with someone else's 
dream basket. Because there's always a catch. Dan, Tenoria, David, and Brandy got hit with the bombshell that they couldn't use any of the ingredients they had picked out. Talk about a frustrating twist. In other words, they were forced to cook with the ingredients from the other contestants' baskets. But things were about to get even more interesting. And the decision of who will get which basket is up to Sean. Sean had the power to shuffle around the ingredient baskets, and the other four cooks weren't exactly thrilled about it. But you won't believe what happened next. Rattled some cages. No, I mean, this doesn't even get protein, and then I get this. And no, it's. David's fiery temper erupted in a big way. He had his heart set on impressing the judges with some homemade pasta, but when he ended up with Dan's basket filled with random Asian ingredients and a package of smoked trout, he lost it. I honestly felt like we were on Hell's Kitchen for a second there, with all those curses he lobbed at Sean and Dan for ruining his plans. But that's not all. As soon as the competition started, David decided to do this. Forget it. It's crazy that David even staged a walkout, even after Ramsey called after him so many times. I can't believe Ramsey actually did this. David, wait, 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 wait. It worked. It's fine. David. Yep. The chef managed to talk some sense into him and convinced him to get back to his station. Well, I would have let him leave, but I guess Ramsey saw potential in David that, well, I just didn't see. However, despite his apology, the whole event left a sour taste in everyone's mouth. I want David gone. He has no respect for anybody except himself. Be here to compete with integrity or get the hell out of the kitchen. But Ramsey's no-nonsense response was pretty refreshing. Just imagine, this is for Liliana and you, and you had to make something for your daughter for the weekend. But you won't believe what happened next. David, you are not. Going home tonight. David's unexpected survival in that episode raised some eyebrows and questions among viewers. Yeah, it was pretty unfair to everybody else, especially considering David's tantrum. Ramsey's sudden change of heart and his plea for David to return to the competition left many wondering why. It's true that moments like this can fuel discussions about whether reality TV shows like MasterChef are scripted or rigged to some extent. It was a unique situation where David, despite quitting for a moment there, was allowed to stay in the competition. Which doesn't always happen on shows like these, especially with Ramsay around. The man hates quitters. Remember this time from Hell's Kitchen? You're an asshole. That's not cool, Jeff. Unbelievable. That is not f***ing cool. But then again, one might argue that Ramsey is softer on MasterChef compared to Hell's Kitchen. I mean, it's a whole different crowd of cooks. Either way, Ramsey is known for his tough love and high standards. But in this particular instance, he seemed to show an unusual level of compassion. Whether it was a genuine decision based on the circumstances or a scripted moment for dramatic effect is something that we'll probably never know but it's definitely something people online will speculate about for ages. And either way, you can't say it didn't add an unexpected twist to the episode. Okay, so we all know what MasterChef is. See, there's the logo, MasterChef. But sometimes I honestly have to double check what show I'm watching. Like this time, where a contestant was on fire, literally. You see, Helene had a bit of an oops moment during the duck mystery box challenge. Fire. We got a fire. Well, she almost set the place on fire in the last five minutes. But when Ramsey stepped in to control the situation, he nearly burned his hand in the process. Despite the seriousness of the incident, guess what Helene did? You set the place on fire. What? <laughs> no, it's not funny. Yeah, I'm not sure whether that was a genuine laugh or a nervous one. But Ramsey was right in that it was no laughing matter. And she ended up agreeing with him in the end. Now, none of this mattered when it came down to the results. Because her dish wasn't even chosen for the tasting. We've now chosen three dishes that stood out. 
Despite Helene's high hopes, Samantha, Ryan, and Scott were called up to the front instead of her. Maybe try not burning the place down next time. So the three were excited for having made it to the top three. But there was a twist. You managed to cook all the worst three dishes. Whoops. Maybe there's hope for Helene yet. What? We're all gobsmacked. All the contestants were shocked at the turn of events, but there was more to come. First up, it was Ryan's turn to present his dish, and this is what he brought up. I made a balsamic rum glazed duck breast with some normalized bananas. Well, it looks like it was plated by a kid. This is what Joe had to say. Bananas? I mean, it's like, is this a joke? As for Graham, forget about the flavor. It was the presentation that put him off. It looks like you plated it and then stepped on it. But now, let's see what the big man himself had to say. That's what's happened. You've gone bananas. Well, I have to say, it was one of those few times when Ramsey's joke didn't exactly land the way he wanted it to. I mean, how many of you actually thought that was hilarious, huh? Anyway, when it came to the taste, Ramsey wasn't in a very fun mood. You have managed to cook the duck. Everything else around that is dreadful. Meanwhile, Samantha and Scott's dishes didn't exactly win them any favors either. A little overcreative. Overcreative. Delusional. So it was now time to announce the biggest loser among the three. But just as Ramsey started to speak, Ryan had the brilliant idea to interject. And out of the two of us, I'd say that the duck was better executed. Yeah, he tried to toss Samantha under the bus, saying that she should be the one going home instead of him. But Ramsey shut him down. You're in this competition, competing, not judging. Despite that, the judgment had been made. And Samantha, who'd already been walking on thin ice, got the boo. Moral of the story, burn the MasterChef kitchen down, I think. Anyway, let's skip to episode 9 of season 8, when Christina Tozzi, Aron Sanchez, and our guy Ramsey had a pretty unique challenge in store for the home cooks. Tonight, you'll be preparing an incredible dinner. Yep. This wasn't going to be an easy task. I mean, cooking for a fully booked restaurant is no joke, even if it's your full-time job. Anyway, guess who made it as the team captains? We are picking the team captains. If that wasn't enough, the judges decided to throw another curveball. Tonight, you're cooking with their product. Now, that's more like it. I mean, cooking with local ingredients can be a bit limiting creatively, but the contestants were up for the challenge. Speaking of the challenge, each team received a big box filled with identical contents and 90 minutes on the clock. The diners, who brought the ingredients to the challenge in the first place, would then vote after tasting both teams' creations. Standard MasterChef team competition stuff so far. But what wasn't standard was how the judges started placing bets. Arone threw in his lot with the red team thanks in no small part to what Adam had going on. On the other hand, Ramsey bet on the blue team, considering Caitlyn had a lot of potential. However, Christina raised a crucial question about accountability within the blue team. Who is gonna call Caitlyn out if an idea doesn't make sense on that dish? Yeah, she had a point, didn't she? Anyway, the dynamics and leadership within each team were gonna be put to the test as the challenge kicked off. Right off the bat, Caitlyn gave Daniel instructions on how to cook the halibut. I would really like to have the crispy skin on there. Okay. But Daniel had one huge concern. He was dead set against cooking the halibut with the skin on. It's gonna be more problematic. That's what I'm saying. If we don't get it right, it can ruin the entire dish. However, Caitlin, like Christina foretold at the beginning, had a ton of opinions that she wasn't willing to change. Seeing this, Ramsey pitched in to point out her mistake. Yeah, very unforgiving, very fatty under there. Sure. And when someone like Ramsey gives you advice, you better take it. What's more, he also questioned the inclusion of ricotta in the dish altogether, finding it pretty much unnecessary. There's elements of your dish that are lost in translation and they're not making sense. Okay. Despite the feedback, Caitlin continued with what she had in mind. So, Ramsey dropped her one final warning. While Caitlin was steadfast that she was in the right, not everyone on her team shared her confidence. Like, for instance, Reba had a bad feeling that they were headed towards disaster. No matter what, take what he says into consideration. Meanwhile, if what Ramsey said wasn't any indication, the judges were worried too. 
There's no way you're gonna get through it. It will not render down. Oh my. Anyway, as time ticked on, the teams rallied to get their dishes plated, and Caitlin was quite proud of the outcome. Colors look amazing, and I think the flavors work really well together. But would the confidence show in her dish? Turns out, they finally decided to go with Ramsey's advice, and well, they turned out to be victorious. Hmm, guess that Ramsey guy knows what he's talking about. But not every risk ends up in victory, and what happened in this next episode is proof of that. So Arone kicked the day off by teasing a challenge involving, well, this. But for those of you who are still confused about what the challenge was about, let me allow Ramsey to explain it for you. Tonight, you'll be making homemade sausages. Since none of the home cooks had ever made something like that before, Arone took the lead to demonstrate the process with chorizo. He combined pork shoulder, fat, vinegar, white wine, ground cinnamon, clove, garlic, and ancho chili before throwing it into the mixer. But here comes the most challenging part. Just push it down lightly. Use your hand, guys, as the guide. While the entire process looked easy, the contestants knew that looks could be deceiving. And boy, would they be. I don't have a lot of experience at all, none, making sausage. But of course, Arone kept a pro tip to himself. One of the things that is an absolute must is to almost over season. Maybe you would have wanted to drop that little hint ahead of time? Anyway, the chefs got to work as the judges stood on, watching the chaos unfold. Fast forward to judgment, and Dorian brought up this little masterpiece. My sausage is wild boar, fennel, and apple. But that wasn't all. She complimented it with a bowl of cannellini beans and tomatoes infused with fennel seed, cayenne, and garlic to enhance the flavor. To top it off, she added crispy fried okra and served a slice of garlic bread along the edge of the bowl. Safe to say, she put a lot of thought into every aspect of her dish. And Ramsey was impressed. Visually, the sausage looks Hearty. He admired the robust appearance of the sausage and praised the fantastic bean stew underneath. Aron also joined in, looking forward to digging into the rich flavor the toasted slice on top had in store. I love the idea of the, the toasted slice on the top. However, when it was Joe's turn to share his thoughts, he wasn't exactly on the same page as everyone else. Yeah, I disagree. I think the toast cheapens the dish. But thankfully, Ramsey called him out on what he said. He tried to poke fun at Joe by, you know, trying to take a dig at him, gently let him know he was in the wrong. But Joe stood his ground. But you don't serve garlic bread in your restaurant? No. And as much as Ramsey was smiling as he watched Joe continue his tirade, his frustration started boiling under that thin veneer. I think it cheapens it and makes it less than it could be. I disagree. Yeah, no kidding. Ramsey was done with Joe, but Joe just kept dishing out criticism even before tasting the dish. And Ramsey stole the words right out of my mouth with what he said next. Would you like a bread? No, I don't want any garlic bread. You're such Snob. But Joe still had to taste the dish. I mean, he can't throw away everything that comes in front of him. And boy, did he eat his words when he got a taste. It tastes good. It's sweet, and uh, tomatoes and beans really work together. God, that was satisfying. And knowing how embarrassed he was deep down made it all the better. But in this next instance, one really strong competitor found themselves on the back foot. Are we saying goodnight to you? So, I'm talking about the elimination challenge of episode 13, season 4. And guess what? Walmart was the awkward sponsor once again. We're about to show you two baskets of ingredients from Walmart. Oh boy. I'm gonna try to ignore the blatant product placement here. Anyway, everyone except Brie had a basket since she won an earlier challenge, and she got to assign everyone one of two baskets. Now, one of these baskets had all the basics to make a modest dessert, and if she used her advantage wisely, she could put one person in danger. And here's why. If anybody out there isn't great with desserts, this could be a way to get them in trouble. Now, this basket cost just under five bucks, but here comes the next one. It has a bounty of produce and groceries. Oh, what was the star of the show, you ask? One of Walmart's choice premium ribeye steaks. I don't know about you, but I'd take a prime steak any day. But 
whatever. The contestants had just 30 minutes to cook the $25 basket. But before the contestants got too carried away, Graham reminded them of something. Walmart sells the highest quality choice steaks. They're certified by the USDA for quality. Oh wow, that really makes me want to consume product. Anyway, Brie, who is now part of the top 10 crew, decided to spice things up. She handed out the one hour baking basket to everyone. Except Natasha, the resident baking whiz. And that meant she had to sit around for 30 minutes before she could even get started. Natasha has a full 30 minutes to just stare at her ingredients. She probably used that time to brainstorm and plan her masterpiece. But this is when Joe noticed something unusual. Most of the time, I don't think she's even mm -hmm. thinking about her basket. And she's just, she has eyes that. full of disdain for Brie. He felt that Natasha was just giving Brie the stink eye and not even thinking about her ingredients. Seriously? Anyway, the judges started to walk around trying to take a peek at the busy chefs at work. And that's when they spotted that Lynn was up to something. I don't even like strawberry jello. I think it's kind of a cheesy ingredient. If you don't like it, why the f are you doing it? But when Ramsey questioned him about his game plan, this is what he had to say. I think I'm gonna do a banana pastry cream instead. Like, did Lynn even know what he was talking about? Well, Ramsey sure did, but he did his damnedest to steer Lynn in literally any other direction. You got no cream to make, they're gonna substitute that with milk. Lynn, are we saying goodnight to you? While Lynn was struggling at his station, on the other side, Chrissy was fretting about her muffins not rising. Ugh. Can someone remind her that it was thanks to the whole load of strawberry gelatin she tossed in? Oh, right, I made a whole video about it. Now it's my turn to pull a Walmart by asking you to go watch it. Consume product. <laughs> anyway, time eventually ran out, as it always does. And it was time for the tasting. And guess whose time it was to present their dish? Uh, the king of plating, Lynn, let's go. Ramsey had lauded him for his accuracy in plating throughout the competition, but this time, Lynn wasn't too sure. But it's ultimately up to the judges, not him. That's incredible. Well, sounds like Lynn had managed to impress once again. But let's take a closer look. Are you serious? Did you drive over it? Yikes, what the heck happened in those 60 minutes that reduced the king of plating to this? I mean, the pavlova, an Aussie slash New Zealand baked meringue classic, looked hideous. However, Lynn decided to skip the excuses and just take the heat. You know this is elimination, right? Ramsey was so disappointed that he called out the dish in the worst way possible. It looks like you slipped in but how did it taste, though? It's rancid. Yeesh. I don't want to even try and imagine that. Ramsey called it the worst dish he'd ever had during his time on MasterChef. And then Joe took the opportunity to join in. Might be a memento for you to take home. Ouch. Lynn was pretty darn sure that this dish was his one-way ticket home. As for Chrissy, well, she didn't waste a second in owning up to the unconventional move she made when it was her turn to go up. Well, it was supposed to be a strawberry muffin until I decided to put the strawberry gelatin in there. But she wasn't done yet. I usually add um, a packet of instant vanilla pudding to some of my cakes to make it really moist. Mm -hmm. Even before the judges, well, passed judgment on her dish, she took it on herself to do it for them turned my muffin into paste, and it's paste. disgusting. Ramsey wasn't about to let it slide. Why would you piss around putting gelatine inside something that you can do with your eyes closed? The judges had placed high hopes in her, but Chrissy had managed to completely squander it. As the tasting came to an end, the bottom three contestants were named. Lynn and Chrissy, obviously, as well as James, who was also there. But they were the three strongest contenders in the competition. But guess who got the boot? You went from hero to zero. Lynn. Yeah, there was no coming back from that pink disaster. But for someone to go from plating dishes that looked like they came straight out of a Michelin-starred kitchen to that? Unexpected doesn't even explain the half of it. This really happening? But now, let's talk about a team challenge which takes the cake for being the worst that MasterChef has ever seen. Oh, oh, God. 
So during episode 14 of season 6, they were in the top 8. And those top 8 home cooks had to prepare a dish with the fresh food stocked up in the huge crates behind them. You see those crates behind you? But here comes the crazy part. You won't be making just one dish. You'll be making around 50 dishes. They had to make about 50 dishes for the MasterChef restaurant that was fully booked to boot. Fully booked with VIPs that got to choose the winning team. Oh boy. So for this challenge, Tommy and Heddle were named team captains. But when Tommy chose Steven, Heddle wasn't too happy about it. Oh my god, I don't believe it! I kind of felt the same too. Meanwhile, Heddle picked Derek for his beautiful plating. But was he happy about it? Heddle does not have the voice of a leader. Yeah, Heddle being a vegetarian wasn't exactly the biggest perk. Anyway, once the teams were ready, the crates were cracked open to reveal the treasure that lay inside. Oh my gosh. Whoa! Steven took a peek and said the veggies looked like his backyard. But what he said next never fails to crack me up. <sighs> it's like my backyard. If I die from working with Tommy, I want you to put me in this box and put me in the ground. God, I love that guy. But when they broke open the meat crate, lo and behold, it was empty. Heddle was over the moon. No meat meant that this challenge was tailor-made for her. She'd be a shoo-in to win for sure. Nick, however, wasn't exactly on the same page. Now, Ramsey stepped up and revealed the theme of the challenge. The home cooks had to cater to the creme de la creme of the vegetarian world. And to do this, they had a tight 60 minutes to prep for a 30-minute restaurant service, and Heddle was almost instantaneously ready with her game plan, like she was born for this very moment. We're gonna do a potato, chickpea, English pea, and cauliflower curry with a tomato gravy. She was gunning for a curry with rice and tomato gravy, with a team that had barely even tried Indian food before. Claudia was skeptical. My only concern right here is that you're the only one that knows those spices, and none of us do. But nothing was gonna rain on Heddle's parade. On the other side, Tommy's teammates threw in the suggestion of butternut squash and rice. You sure we shouldn't do just a tiny bit of a rice? No okay. rice. Tommy tried to float his own ideas, but they all got shot down. But eventually, after some back and forth, they finally nailed down a menu. Anyway, Ramsey's eyes were on Heddle and he expected her to shine in this challenge. She is a vegetarian. Tonight, she's got to shine. However, Derek wasn't completely on board. I'm going with my team captain. These are elements that I'm not really comfortable with. Ramsey asked Heddle to play the part of a captain, gather her team, and pick up the pace. It was her kitchen, after all. Nothing's gonna be ready in time if you don't move your ass. Quickly. Things turned out to be more chaotic than they'd bargained for. More of everything? No, 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 no. No. Claudia started to get frustrated because only Heddle knew the ins and outs of the menu, and the rest of the team was struggling. We all need direction. We need to know what our next step is. Christine was completely baffled. Unbelievable. Heddle made a final push to get everyone on the same page, and finally they started to pull things together. Meanwhile, Tommy was struggling with problems of his own. When he revealed that they were whipping up a mushroom and butternut squash dish, Ramsey wasn't impressed. V I see that. VIP. I see that. Things were getting more heated by the minute, and Tommy soon realized that his team was a complete mess. Let's get it done. We got 22 minutes until we serve. Meanwhile, when Christine walked in to check over Team Heddle, turns out the team had hit a snag with rice of all things. What's wrong with the rice? Is there no way to reduce, like, cook no, it out? it's like complete water. Let's hope they rescue all that drowning rice. Tommy's frustration hit a boiling point as he admitted his team overrode him, and he clearly didn't want to take ownership of the mess at that point. And while he tried to focus on plating, Katrina's relentless nagging was driving him up the wall. Tommy, we gotta hurry up. And all I can hear is, Tommy, don't, Tommy, Tommy, please. He was on the brink of losing it. And finally, he erupted. Tommy, can you? Shut up. Yeah, seriously, just follow the leader, will ya? And surprisingly, it worked. When service kicked off, they miraculously started to work together. Imagine that, in a team challenge of all things. We're rock and rolling. Here you go. Service, please. But all things must come to an end, and what an end it was. Red team. Oh, man. Oh. Tommy was over the moon, 
basking in the glory of his win while the blue team headed to the pressure test. Obviously, Heddle was feeling a heavy dose of guilt, and Derek all but kicked her while she was down. Olivia, Claudia, and I do not deserve this. You hate to see it. Now, if you've ever been in the same room as an episode of MasterChef, you know it doesn't take much for Joe to get angry. Here's the problem with this whole round. But here's a look at some of the times when he totally lost it. Just like this time, when chaos erupted during an elimination round in season one. Now, I'm not one to joke around. Or, well, wait, I am actually. Anyway, believe me when I say this, things got wild in episode four, in no small part due to Jenna's antics. Everything you pick up and put in that basket, think Chinese, through and through. So this episode was all about embracing the flavors of China. And this time, as the mystery box winner, Whitney had the power to choose the main ingredient for the competing chefs. She had to pick between Chinese mushrooms, oranges, or duck. And what did Whitney end up settling for? Is Mandarin oranges. Yes! Yeah, not everybody was happy with those Mandarin oranges they were stuck with and things hit the ground running as far as tension was concerned. Now, off you go. Get in the Chinese ball, baby, come on. And can you blame them? Chinese cuisine is no joke. It's not something you can master in just a day, much less an hour. Like, Ramsey himself was on the struggle bus when he tried to learn Chinese dim sum from the masters over on the F word. Another one of his shows. You know... Let me know if you're interested in me covering that show in the future. Anyway, back to Jenna. A lot of sizzle, Jenna. What's going on? Uh, Asian orange stir fry. Uh, sure. Sounds fine, I guess. But would she be able to deliver? It's basically an orange chicken with the snap peas with the orange infused rice. So Jenna walked up with her orange stir fry. Which, like, orange chicken, I get it. But that wasn't the issue here. You placed it up with 20 minutes to go. Right. And food dies as it sits in the window, clearly. Yeah, it had been a whole freaking 20 minutes since Jenna had plated her dish. And Ramsay was hoping that the dish wouldn't have dried out while sitting around at her station. Or like, gotten stone freaking cold. And that had better taste phenomenal to put it up with 20 minutes to go. But here's where Joe comes in. He stepped up to dig in. And when he took a bite of what Jenna had the gall to put in front of him, well, you read the title of the video. This is the problem. Way to poke the bear, Jenna. After savoring the dish, Joe promptly dropped a bombshell as he looked over to the other contestants and gave them a fair warning. If you don't want to deliver on the highest level, if you want to play the game and be safe, you're not going to win this. Joe was clearly not a fan of Jenna's dish, and even went to the extent of calling it boring. With this whole round. Huh, I was expecting something a little more, I don't know, detailed. Like, where's the panache? Either way, Joe's anger was completely justified. I mean, you can't just plate any old dish and expect to get handed the prize money. But Joe was like a canary in the coal mine here. The other judges didn't even bother tasting it. <sighs> Meanwhile, Joe reminded the contestants of something crucial. We're trying to find the best amateur chef in America. The kid gloves had already been off, and they weren't about to put them back on. Get ready to bring it, and if you're not, you should probably just leave your apron and check yourself out right now. Damn, he laid it all out, didn't he? And Jenna stood there processing the chaos she had unwittingly unleashed. It's not the spirit of what we came here to do. Joe's disapproval of her dish definitely made her question her abilities, but I guess that's Joe for ya. Now, this may have been one of the first times Joe dismissed a dish, but it wouldn't be the last. Now, like Ramsey, Joe is known for his outbursts. They're a little less constructive, but I've already talked that topic to death and it isn't really relevant here. But I wanna focus on those silent death stares that are so filled with judgment. I'd say that's even worse than getting chewed out in my book. Technical error, raw garlic. You realize that? I... Let me get into it. 
During an elimination challenge, they brought Whitney Miller back into the kitchen, the winner of season one. Whitney Miller! <laughs> she brought her cookbook with her too, and the contestants, including the star of this section, were in for a wild ride. Or at least Adrian was. Now, the deal was to replicate dishes from Whitney's cookbook. Crispy catfish. Jennifer scored a whole basket of ingredients to perfect her version of Whitney's catfish dish. As for Adrian and everybody else, they weren't so lucky. Call it the winner's edge. 29 ingredients of Whitney's crispy catfish dish by looking and tasting alone. Anyway, as part of the challenge, all the contestants got to taste the dish. And soon after, they had 10 minutes of pantry time to get what they needed. Some were confident, like Christian strutting into the pantry like he owned the place. Others weren't too sure of themselves. Five minute trip to the pantry to replicate everything in the dish. Uh, well, Adrian was one of the confident ones. I'm feeling all right, doing pretty good. I gotta keep it simple the way I tasted it. Fast forward to the tasting and Adrian felt like he was on top of the world, but you wouldn't know that by that awful plating. I was so caught up in making sure that it tasted right that the plating just but hey, at least he was self-aware. The way Whitney plates it. There's nothing I can do. I'm just gonna have to take it. And turns out there was a reason, or well, excuse behind it. Thanks. Graham didn't even bother giving any feedback, but Joe wasn't gonna let him walk out of there unscathed on his watch. So obviously another contestant who refuses to follow direction. I don't really understand. Yeah, he didn't even have to taste the dish to make that comment. But when he actually did... This doesn't taste great. It wasn't just about the taste. He simply couldn't fathom how things went so wrong. But turns out, he knew how to fix it. Or at least that's what he wanted everyone to believe. Because a few moments later, Joe pulled out a spare plate from below and started replating the dish all by himself. And you have to see how he did it. Let me win this contest for you, all right? So you take this, put it here, like it was on Whitney's dish. And he kept going and going and going. Oh yeah, Joe really just dropped a 12 second masterclass on our guy here out of nowhere. And it definitely drew a whole lot of reactions from everybody including Ramsey. Meanwhile, Adrian was just standing there, completely stunned. Talk about adding insult to injury. But I mean, dropping a dish in need of some serious TLC was kind of just asking for a schooling, you know? But that was far from the only impromptu lesson Joe's handed out during his time on the show. What happened in season two, episode 13, was a perfect example of that. Enter Susie. I definitely know that I don't have the top dish, but I'm really hoping Christine's dish is worse than mine. You know MasterChef always keeps it interesting, or well, tries. And this week's elimination challenge was no exception. <laughs> If you haven't guessed already, it's pork. Nine different cuts to be exact. And our girl Susie was ready to prove herself. Oh, he hates me. I got pork belly, holy <laughs> When she ended up with pork belly, she kinda deflated a bit. I'm not happy that I have to cook pork belly in one hour, not at all. Handling pork belly is no joke. And it ended up being a huge thorn in her side. When the tasting rolled around, just about everybody was at the top of their game. But as for Susie, not so much. Pork belly, a uh, braised cabbage, and spetzel, as well as uh, a gravy. Ramsey's reaction honestly said it all. Mm. And the kind of spice she was slinging was far from what Ramsey expected and wanted. Quite possibly the worst sauce I've ever tasted. And oh no, he didn't stop there. Dog bits of crap stuck together with, you know, soft bits of spatula at the bottom. Okay, now let me break down this disaster from top to bottom for you. So Susie's dish had potential, but the sauce? Well, this is where she messed up. 
it ended up being so overly spicy and had a hell of a bitter aftertaste. One that, unfortunately, overstayed its already very short welcome. Now, given all this background, guess how things went when Joe got his hands on it. This show is called Master Chef, not Delusional Chef. Joe completely dropped the hammer here, but he also wanted to put Susie in her place. What do you know about German sauces and German cuisine? This is a freaking disaster. She was acting all high and mighty, and like she knew everything. But let's be real. In truth, she was clueless. Somehow even more clueless than Joe's sometimes been. And just when you thought it couldn't get any crazier, Joe said something that ended up being a total game changer. It is awful. And if it doesn't send you home, it probably should. Ever was a perfect image of disappointment? It'd be her face right then. Go, go back to school. Ugh. With every word those judges dropped on her, Susie's dream of winning the title seemed more and more distant. If Adrian's plan was to knock me out of the competition, congratulations, you just did it. But hey, can we talk about the fact that she didn't even try to own up to the disaster she'd wrought? I mean, come on! Despite her obvious mistakes, she went all out and blamed Adrian for her disastrous performance. And I mean, he was still reeling from what happened to him four episodes earlier. Like, way to kick a guy while he's down. The fact that she couldn't even muster a half-hearted apology was just... Blah. It somehow tastes nastier than her dish probably did. <sighs> All right, rant's over. For now, at least, because I've probably got a few more coming if these last few examples have been any indication. Now, if you ask me, I think season three of MasterChef had to be one of the wildest seasons ever. And episode 15 really solidified that. During the elimination challenge, yet another contestant came into the spotlight for all the wrong reasons. Corn and beef. Picture this. So. Josh was standing there, beads of sweat forming on his forehead as the details of the task he was expected to nail were dropped in front of him. Still one of you will be making a dessert. But there was a catch. They had to make a dessert using something you could never imagine. Corn. Corn. Not exactly everybody's favorite cookie topping. Now, Josh was quite confident going into it, but it had all but drained away by the time he'd gotten through that nightmare of a challenge. Play with a corn-infused caramel. What you're looking at is corn creme brulee with corn caramel, which to me had to have been doomed from the start. And Joe was of a like mind. He took one look at Josh's creation and, well, let's just say he wasn't impressed. I think. We can all agree on that. But wait, there was more. But if you can believe it, that was just the presentation. If that was the long and short of it, we'd have another Adrian situation on our hands. But unfortunately for Josh, well, he wasn't so lucky. Way too sweet. Now, since things weren't exactly going in his favor, Josh tried to be smart and thought defending his dish would help him save face a little. I don't think it's terrible though, but I mean, I think it's, it's very- You don't think it's terrible, I think it's terrible. But that kind of backfired real bad, unsurprisingly. It's very you don't think it's terrible, I think it's terrible. That's really all that matters, right? Yeah, you're right. But when Joe made his disappointment crystal clear, Josh just wasn't convinced. Sent you home once, that's bad. And then Graham chimed in with his own set of remarks. Yeah. but. It does not look appetizing. I just expect more from you. And it took this on the likeliest of tag teams to finally start breaking through Josh's shell. With every minute that passed, an ounce of criticism that was given, it was getting harder and harder for Josh to bear it. Because when it came down to the deliberations, Josh had his heart in his mouth. The judges had made their decision, and the three worst dishes of the night were called up. Josh was obviously in serious trouble, but Felix and David were here to keep him company at his darkest hour. So he had that going for him. For the rolls, Felix, I mean, those were so bad. As Josh stepped forward, ready to face his destiny, something unexpected happened. You are going back. Yeah, he survived. 
Turns out, even in spite of all the criticism they put him through, the judges decided to give Josh another shot. I mean, maybe they saw a glimmer of potential beneath the spit in the face of nature that was his dish, but whatever it was, Josh's reaction was priceless. A mix of disbelief, gratitude, and relief all at the same time. Maybe a little bit of panic in there too, considering how he was probably never going to be able to live it down. Josh. Gotta say, that was as narrow a miss as you could ask for. But for this next contestant, missing was a way of life for her, at least in this one particular challenge. I'm talking about the Pizza Stone Challenge of Season 3, Episode 10, when Tanya decided to stir the pot more than she probably intended to. If you paid any attention to her journey this season, Tanya had been cruising through the competition. She was honestly a hell of a frontrunner discounting the elephant in the room here. But that's when things took an unexpected turn. That pizza stone she needed to use wouldn't take long to become her tombstone. The pressure is definitely on. Making a dish on a pizza stone isn't super easy, unless you're making, well, pizza. But Tanya decided to tackle the challenge head on. But things didn't exactly get off on the right foot. When Ramsey pointed out a major issue with her ingredients during prep, Tanya was on the verge of breaking down. The lamb is still raw. Well, Tanya wasn't going to be given any second chances here. They've never done that before, and they'll never do it in the future. <clears throat> Foreshadowing. And Tanya was about to learn this the hard way. So cut to the time of the tasting, and Joe, well, take a guess. Lamb cutlets with roasted garlic yogurt and olive flatbread sounds like a winning combo on paper, but execution is key and Tanya's dish was far from where it needed to be. When Joe discovered whole cloves of raw garlic in Tanya's yogurt, any chances that she'd get out of this unscathed were practically dead on arrival. To which a fuming Joe asked her a rhetorical question. We're not here to eat raw flour or raw garlic. And if you think he stopped there, you're so wrong. To be almost kind of personally offensive. You understand that? Yes. And for the finishing move? Step up your cooking game. Oh man, believe me, he meant every word he said. He also advised Tanya to show a little respect for the competition. Like Jenna before her, you can't get away with putting out any old dish in the MasterChef kitchen. But Joe wasn't the only judge pissed off by her that night. Ramsay wasn't a fan of the dish, but he was still in MasterChef mode as far as his temper was concerned. But Joe practically could have been a stand-in for his Hell's Kitchen persona with how pissed he was. And things got so bad that the judges pulled a double elimination, which both she and Mike were on the receiving end of that night. Told you that she'd be earning her tombstone this episode, but that didn't mean her journey was done. Four episodes later, she managed to claw her way back into the competition when they brought back the last eight eliminated contestants. And while she put up a hell of a fight, she didn't have it in her to earn her apron back. Ooh, wait, didn't I say something about them not giving second chances? Well, here comes a season winner, yes, a season winner, whose second chance made all the difference. I'm talking about Courtney from season five. Like Tanya before her, she was one to watch out for that season. And considering she won it all, that should go without saying. So in episode four, she was up against the donut challenge, but things were gonna be a lot more sour than sweet. Or, well, salty. Things hit a snag right from the start as Courtney forgot a crucial ingredient. I'm remaking my dough because I forgot to add eggs to it. Eggs! But that's not the only thing she missed out on. Don't have any yeast. Elise, did you grab any extra yeast? This left Iran wondering what in the world she was up to. For donuts, then you're kind of and you should go home. Anyway, the show must go on. Courtney hustled to rectify her mistake, pulling out all the stops, even resorting to some sweet talking to grab some yeast that was lying around. She practically canvassed the entire kitchen, hitting up every contestant in sight, but no one stepped up to lend a hand, except for this one dude. You have the whole kitchen in here. Do you have any extra yeast? I love 
Francis, the sweetest guy you'll ever meet. Major props, dude. Anyway, despite busting her butt in the kitchen, things took a nosedive during the tasting, as seems to be a theme this video. Ramsey took one look at the plate, and he was lost for words. Wow. And when he finally sliced into it, from the outside, the donut had that perfect, crispy exterior. But once he took a bite, it was a whole different story. Salt. They're salty. That's seriously salty. Salt. I'm not even kidding. Salt. This aired years ago, and I'm still not over it. I mean, how careless can you be? First you forget the eggs, then the yeast, and even the freaking sugar? I mean, what am I supposed to even say here? But I mean, there had to be an explanation, right? Picked everything up and kept going, and that I didn't give like up. Your... Graham didn't hold back either. He straight up said that Courtney's donuts were like biting into rocks, nowhere near airy or fluffy enough. Like, imagine expecting a soft, pillowy cloud of donut goodness. But instead you get this heavy, dense thing that'd better serve you as a paperweight. That's how far off it was. But it was Joe Bastianich who delivered the harshest blow. He couldn't fathom how Courtney managed to mess up such a simple dish. It had to have happened when I was just rushing to get... But then he dropped this comment that hit her like a ton of bricks. It's hard for me to even like them. I'm sorry, Chef. No points for guessing that Courtney was handed a first-class, all-expenses-paid trip into the danger zone that night. Bit of a surprise. Courtney. In the end, it was Kira, who was nominated alongside her, whose fate was sealed instead, sparing Courtney from elimination by the skin of her teeth. Courtney, please put your apron on your bench. Your time is done. She had to have been thanking her lucky stars that one chef's lack of passion was all the difference between her going home in episode four and her winning the whole damn thing. Well, that's all I've got. If I missed any of your favorite Joe outbursts, or times he got hot and heavy with the nearest trash can, get in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. And definitely be sure to check out my social media pages if you want to keep up with the latest stuff I'm working on. And of course, if you thought this video was crazy, then you have to check out this next one right here. It's even crazier!